Lives of the Unconscious. A podcast on psychoanalysis and psychotherapy. Episode 23 on the psychoanalysis of conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories, if we must call them theories, are generally speaking always booming. At times, rather simmering in the background, while at other times, especially in times of crisis, standing out conspicuously. They are, without a doubt, a socio-psychological phenomena of extraordinary dimensions. A large percentage of the population ascribes to at least one of the current theories. Conspiracy theories have surely existed ever since there have been conspiracies. They aren't always irrational. A Roman emperor would have done well to speculate about possible conspiracies. For as is well known, only a minority of his rank died of natural causes. But it is only since the modern age, especially since the French Revolution and the emergence of bourgeois society, that they have taken on epidemic proportions and increasingly paranoid, irrational forms. And this, seemingly in contrast to the age of enlightenment, science, and rationality. In recent decades, digitalization and social media have clearly acted like a combustive agent. Conspiracy theories are in our thoroughly rationalized and secularized society omnipresent. But it is not only in different time periods that conspiracy theories have gained exceptional virulence, but also in different countries, often correlating with the history of violence. Say, for example, in the United States, where conspiracy has been an integral part of political debate at least since the War of Independence, and was further intensified by the so-called American Indian Wars. The legal concept of conspiracy, here the conspiracy against peace, under which the Nazi criminals were put on trial in Nuremberg, was a specifically American ingredient. However, the most consequential proliferation of conspiracy theories took place in National Socialist Germany by reference to the very archetype of conspiracy theories in general, the anti-Semitic thesis of the Jewish world conspiracy, which today continues to be virulent worldwide in the only mildly modified form of a so-called Zionist conspiracy. In this episode, we would like to focus on a psychoanalytic understanding of conspiracy theories, whereby the psychoanalytic approach is certainly not the only comprehensive approach, and yet it is clearly indispensable. Conspiracy theories are a depth psychological phenomena par excellence. The distinction between irrational conspiracy theories and well-founded skepticism or critique is often not trivial. After all, skepticism and critique are hallmarks of mature thought, and this is frequently directed against official doctrines and paradigms. In precisely those places where power is concentrated, whether that be in politics or in large institutions, history teaches us that a certain mistrust is indeed warranted, even against apparent self-evident facts. Not everything that the mainstream considers absurd is indeed absurd. Sometimes, only a few years lie between eco-crackpots and future technologies. Conspiracy theories cannot be understood by differentiating them from some supposedly reasonable normality, for normality may in some circumstances not be so reasonable at all. Conspiracy theorist is a pejorative term that must be used with care. Not everyone can express themselves fluently in the language of theoretical abstractions. Rage against the powers that be does not, however, have to be a conspiracy theory. It can be an attempt to put into words a very real experience, such as oppression or exclusion. In contrast to critical thinking, however, conspiracy theories are static, foreclose the connection to real experiences, do not engage in argumentative objections and the movement of thought, but rather are, in contrast, downright immune. 
Their characteristic feature is personification. Social developments, crises, and economic dynamics are attributed to the plans and intentions of specific masterminds. These theories don't allow for or reflect on contradictions. There is hardly any tolerance for ambiguity or for dealing with any incomprehension, uncertainty, or lack of clarity. Everything is always traced back to the same cause, the personified evil that can be clearly separated from the good. Their style of argumentation is definitive, as in, that's how it is, get informed, instead of discursive, in the sense of an attempt at an open understanding that also holds true from the perspective of others. Instead of critically reflecting on official information, political decisions, and scientific findings, and then integrating them into the movement of thought, they posit a different reality, alternative facts, with sources that are, to be sure, far more dubious. In this, there is a certain kinship with the delusional system, where an alternative reality is also set up, albeit here a socially shared reality that finds its appropriate expression in the filter bubble. Government measures to counter conspiracy theories by introducing seals for trustworthy public information may contribute to easing a muddled situation, but the plea to place one's trust in the right instead of the wrong facts misses the core of conspiracy thinking and responds to conspiracy beliefs on its limited terms. Not to mention when the government itself spreads conspiracy theories. Thinking fixated on facts, facts, facts as a way of refusing discourse is, as we'll hear later, perhaps rather cause than antidote to belief in conspiracies. Conspiracy theories, also here related to delusional systems, can in themselves be very consistent, and yet are usually part of a conglomeration of convictions, suspicions, and assumptions that have a rather diffuse character. Chemtrails, microchips, ethnic repopulation, and the like usually make up a confused mixture that in the end is only held together by a central conspiracy theory, which, especially in Western societies, often has an anti-Semitic tinge. The world conspiracy of George Soros, Bill Gates, Hollywood, and Wall Street. It is, in reality, not a theory at all in the sense of an advanced form of thought, but rather a kind of brew in which all manner of things is concocted. Conspiracy theories derive their power from affects, not from arguments. And it is for this reason that they are resistant to argumentation, much more a case for deep psychology than for scientific debate. The phantasmic content of conspiracies, lizards, secret gatherings, hollow earth, is closer to the visual world of the unconscious, at least to those collective phantasms. This is also why they are interesting for pop culture and the film industry, whereby here it may rather be said, the more abstruse, the more enticing. In a few loose remarks, we would like to attempt to work out certain aspects of conspiracy theories and classify them psychoanalytically. The central thesis is that conspiracy theories fulfill certain psychic functions for stabilizing a weak ego, whereby we would like here to work out five such functions in particular. Number one, they reduce complexity and eliminate uncertainty. Number two, they bind fear, envy, and aggression. Number three, they work in the service of projection. Number four, they gratify narcissism. And number five, they establish identity. Number one, the reduction of complexity and uncertainty. One of the impositions of existence is that the social and inner world indeed also nature, are full of contradictions, obscurity, uncertainty, and ambiguity. It is one of the basic principles of psychoanalytic thought that there are different interests, forces, and inclinations that are in conflict even within ourselves. Crises in particular 
bring further disorder and thus confusion into the inner and outer world. Uncertainty and not knowing generate tension. They can only be endured to a limited degree, depending on the maturity or strength of the ego. The psychoanalyst Wilfred Bion speaks here, in reference to the poet John Keats, of negative capability, i.e. the ability to endure not knowing, not understanding, a mixture of uncertainty and frustration tolerance. This already limited ability may, through constant electronic stimulation and pseudo-gratification, undergo yet further impairment. This is, at the same time, the central capacity for the psychoanalytic process, but also for creative activities of all sorts. Those who want to create something new, something different, must be able to handle the fact that they are dealing with something that is not yet. Conspiracy theories suggest here an apparent easy shortcut. They offer explanatory formulas in which ultimately every event Every uncertainty and ambiguity is resolved. It is known who is responsible. In this way, personification is the paramount means of simplification. The anonymous, incomprehensible powers get names. Omnipotent chess players are installed, and world events become clear to those who know their intentions. Modernity, in Western societies, probably since the French Revolution at the latest, means the increasing depersonalization of power. There is no king, no patriarch as the personal embodiment of power. This parallels the disappearance of the patriarch, the ruling father figure in the family. As a result, however, power has not disappeared, nor has a space free of domination come into being. Rather, power has become diffuse, not easy to pinpoint. One senses that even the supposed decision-makers are subject to the same particular logic of power, that they are not in control of what is happening, appearing instead as if compelled. Here, the paranoid moment of modern power structures shows up, if you will, as the psychological flip side of democratization. Power can be understood according to systems theory as something that does not take on form through individual people, but rather through systems, which, though created by people, have long since gone beyond their control. Conspiracy theories are, in a certain sense, the counter-model to systems theory. They try to repersonalize power, to assign it to individual persons and decision-makers once again, to call the supposedly real power-holders by name. Wherever the structure of power is, in fact, more personalized, in the royal court, in the inner assembly of the White House, in the feudal system of the Roman Empire, in the allocation of construction contracts worth millions, there may indeed also be actual conspiracies afoot, arrangements, one could also say, a potential for corruption. But the more a system develops into a power dynamic that is non-personal, which is not or cannot be controlled by anyone, for instance, on the stock exchange or in a pandemic, the more likely the conspiracy theories acquire a paranoid character, the more they become an attempt through fantasy or delusion to restore a personal order to an incomprehensible situation. The reduction of complexity is indeed a necessity, but by no means a sufficient ingredient Basically, all abstract thought, even science, reduces complexity. For conspiracy theories, further aspects must also apply. Number two, binding fear, envy, and aggression. Conspiracy theories are dangerous because they are a vehicle for destructive forces. This is quite obvious in some manifestations of conspiracy theories such as violent demonstrations, terrorism, or state-organized violence against, say, minorities. However, even at demonstrations by groups dressed in the well-meaning guise of, for example, worrying about the safety of children, there is a potential for aggression 
that anyone willing to consult their own feelings, one could also say one's own countertransference, will not be able to rule out. Conspiracy theories draw on people's diffuse fears and multiply them. They are also a reservoir for hate and aggression that can indeed also be traced back to real experiences of humiliation and powerlessness. They bring together destructive affects, stir them up with fear, and redirect them towards an object, a person, or a group. Out of diffuse aggression becomes focused aggression, which can develop into an obsession, hatred, which, as is well known, is just as strong a binding agent as love. The aggression is likewise legitimized in that the conspirators are devised as powerful and superior, so that by supposedly revolting against the powerful authorities, they are able to always construe themselves as the victim. The uploading of aggression and the gratification of affect is here endowed with the moral superiority of the resistance fighter, if you will. The superego is taken into the service of the id. Whenever conspiracy theories of this kind have been able to seize real power, it has always resulted in the persecution of minorities and the defenseless. Number 3. Psychological Relief Through Projection The mechanism of projection, outsourcing the undesirable parts of oneself onto others, might well be at the heart of conspiracy thinking. Projection is one of the early defense mechanisms. It is based on the psychological process of splitting. With its help, the world is divided into good and evil. There are the knowledgeable, who are able to defend themselves, among whom one would certainly count oneself, and the greedy, perverse, dirty, and powerful, plus the sleepy-headed and the stupid, who fall for the tricks of the powerful. Good and bad, here an early form of thinking, cannot be thought together. That means, in turn, no ambivalences and contradictions can be tolerated. It is a matter of creating an ideal world, in which only good remains, after which it has been purified of evil. Projection unburdens the ego. It expels undigested affects and places them with the other. It is something one wants to rid oneself of but which, like a shadow, is always in pursuit, for it is, after all, one's own self. The conspiracy theorist, here related to the paranoid, feels pursued and threatened by dangerous powers, compulsory vaccination, microchips, chemtrails. That which cannot be withstood within is fought against without. This, however, brings about an immutable bond Like being chased in a dream, the persecutor cannot be cast off, for it is, after all, one's own self. At the same time, one cannot release oneself from this projection, for that would mean recognizing that it comes from within. For this reason, the following sentence may well hold true. Tell me what conspiracy theory you believe in, and I will tell you on what topic your soul labors. Power, greed, fear, need for recognition, aggression, envy, sexual frustration, or all of the above. Number four, the gratification of narcissism. Conspiracy theories promise a narcissistic enhancement. Whether the cause be powerlessness, weakness, frustration, or experiences of humiliation, Through the conspiracy theory, the person is transformed into one of the initiated, the knowledgeable. Conspiracy theories have something grandiose about them. One presumably has insights into the grand scheme of things, into the puppet show of world politics, world government. Depending on the extent of the conspiracy theory, one even has insights into the concerns of extraterrestrials or the secret truth of world history. One can feel superior to the mainstream, belonging to an elite of like-minded people. The narcissistic devaluation of the other 
who does not understand what one proclaims to know, is always close by. In contrast to the psychotic, however, the ego does not dare to take a seat at the center of this grandiose theory of the world. It does not want to take responsibility for its own grandiosity, as it were. When an individual is addressed and questioned critically about the alleged grand scheme of things, reference is then made to the group, leading figures or supposed facts that one can read about in the internet. Conspiracy theories offer the opportunity to be grandiose without, at the same time, having to say, I. Number 5. The Foundation of Identity Conspiracy theories help the ego to distinguish itself and, over time, they become part of one's identity. As in every community, membership in a group creates a strong sense of identity. Here, the group helps in the service of strengthening the ego to sustain a distortion of reality and to incorporate it into one's own ego. Conspiracy theories become the cement of the psychological architecture. Again, the mechanism of splitting helps here, not only in creating good and evil, but also an inside and an outside. Outside are the evil, the bad, the simple-minded. Inside are the good, the clean, the knowing. Hatred, the devaluation of others, becomes an act of self-constitution. In the words of the psychoanalyst Heribert Blas, I hate, therefore I am. Conspiracy theories turn into a permanent fixture, into a possession of the ego, something one knows not only about the world, but also about oneself. The more uncertain one's own identity becomes, all the more vehemently will this possession be defended. This is why many conspiracy theorists feel personally hurt or attacked when the theory is challenged, thus reacting aggressively. For this reason, all astuteness and subtlety are negated in defense of the irrational, for it is a matter of defending identity. All the points mentioned ultimately serve to compensate for a weakness of the ego. The cause of the ego weakness can be manifold. By no means should susceptibility to conspiracy theories be regarded as a mere matter of education or intelligence. On the contrary, Many conspiracy theories even stake a claim to a certain level of education in order to decipher hidden relationships and understand the way things truly are. They are perhaps less a sign of being uneducated in the sense of what do the uneducated care about gaining insight into world events than of the perversion of being only half-educated. Although as a whole irrational, some conspiracy theories are, in themselves, astutely and coherently constructed. What is surely of more consequence to understanding conspiracy theories is a fundamental uncertainty. This may be explained biographically, but also socially. Conspiracy theories are an answer to the fear of breakdown, sociologically too as the fear of social decline. They become epidemic, however, whenever social developments attack the foundations of identity, health, integrity, group membership, family ties, or career. Crises such as the corona pandemic are only the tip of the iceberg, but one in which this phenomena is made especially conspicuous. Perhaps they are also the artifacts of transgenerational experiences, effects which spread in those societies in particular that have undergone massive transformations, such as in Eastern Europe, or devastating collective ruptures, perhaps like the United States, which, through immigration, was founded on the breaking of ties, or that only found a national identity very late, such as Germany. But what is true here for individuals is also true for the social psychology of groups. They require a precise and differentiated analysis. In terms of intervention, it is perhaps less advisable to discuss the truthfulness of conspiracy theories. Most of the time, this discussion misses the point entirely. 
The conspiracy theory serves as a psychological defense, has a psychological function, and will therefore not be disposed of by any such objections, no matter how rational. If there is a space for conversation in which a real exchange can take place, a psychoanalytically based intervention would consist much more in opening up a discussion about real experiences, what a person has experienced and is experiencing in their life, what they fear, what they experience in their everyday life and their family at work. Conspiracy theories, no matter how divorced from reality they may be, are a certain way to process those experiences and to ward off painful feelings. But somewhere within them, there may be a trace that leads to that person's actual experiences. Ultimately, it is important to grasp conspiracy theories as a symptom that also says something about the state of society. Since modern times, conspiracy theories have been the constant companion of scientific rationality, its dark shadow, possibly because they belong to it. With this kind of technical thinking, in which the world contains neither anything incomprehensible nor transcendent, in which metaphysics is disavowed and religious topics are written off as so much nonsense, it is striking how well this technical thinking tolerates susceptibility to the crudest of all superstitions, so long as they appear in the rationalistic form of conspiracy theories. Often enough, however, even interests can be found dressed up in the likeness of unalterable facts. Not through a malevolent conspiracy of politics and science, but rather in that social reality is treated as if it were a fact of nature, classified as a brute fact, instead of grasping it within the conditions in which it arose. Fact comes from the Latin fazere and means made, which indeed especially holds true for social and societal occurrences. A politics that understands itself as merely the administrative body of alleged facts seals itself off from thinking, leaves no room for alternatives or anything new. It turns questions of interests, herein the ideological, into questions of facts, of rationality and irrationality as if there was ultimately no such thing as interests and instead only irrational versus an irrational politics, which goes hand in glove with a seemingly unchangeable reality. Conspiracy theorists have a perhaps not so inaccurate sense that the supposed facts themselves arise in certain contexts, that they are not simply a reflection of the truth. However, they do not arrive at critical thought but instead invent new facts, that is, create a largely imagined counter-reality, which is then indeed irrational and, in the end, does not move beyond mere belief in facts, rather reduplicating it into abstruseness. Conspiracy theories, in the end, they are conspiracy phantasma, are a bad copy of scientific rationality, perhaps an unsuccessful social critique but for sure, a disaster for society if they actually seize power. This podcast is written and produced by Cecile Lutz and Jakob Müller. Translated and read by Solomon Lawrence. <laughs>